Hello everyone, Frank Tastic here, and welcome back to Ghost Recon Breakpoint. Now, today's video is actually going to be rather simple, and that is to basically answer some of the common questions that I get asked quite often on a lot of my videos. Do I use mods? What are my in-game settings? What attachments do I use? What is my favorite weapons? And last but not least, what is my top three favorite classes? So to easily answer the first one, do I use mods, the answer is no. I don't. There is a couple different reasons why I choose not to use mods, but probably one of the biggest reasons why I choose not to use mods in Ghost Recon Breakpoint is because for one, sometimes they can be a little difficult or just simply complicated to install. And although I was able to actually figure out how to install mods for Ghost Recon Breakpoint, I was not really a fan of some of them. Now to be fair, there was a lot of cosmetic mods that I did enjoy, but for some odd reason they either did not work correctly, my game kept crashing, the game took forever to load, or they just simply did not work period. Now to be fair, I personally wouldn't mind trying more cosmetic mods. I also realize I have a lot of people suggesting me to do the Spartan mod, and I have. Now there's no video of me using it on my channel, and there's a reason why. The main reason comes down to the mod was just kind of broken when I used it. Now of course, maybe it's had some patches since then. This was, I don't know, maybe a year ago. I can't remember exactly the date. but. When I used it, it simply broke my game. Now, when I had only cosmetic mods, my game never really had any issues. It was mostly the mods themselves. Sometimes the mod texture didn't load correctly, or the mod just simply did not work, so I would just remove it. And there was no point in having it if it didn't correctly show on my operator. But the Spartan mod, oh my god. That mod literally broke my game. If I did have footage to reference to what I'm talking about, I would definitely be showing it right now. But since that was a long time ago, and I've deleted the recordings because it was just so bad then you kind of just have to take my word for it but basically when i had it installed my game kept crashing over and over sometimes the game just simply would not load once i select my character at the main menu or i would just get stuck on the loading screen itself or when i finally got into the game and i would approach a base the game would crash and then on top of all that, when I was finally able to actually play the game, the enemy AI would randomly start attacking the hostages that they had in the cell cages, or they would randomly lock on and detect me through a concrete wall when they had no LOS, or sometimes when I approached a base, the enemies didn't move. And what I mean by that is, you know how when you go to a base and there's people moving around, two man patrols going through the base, etc, etc? Well, when I would get to a base, nobody was moving. The two man patrol would be stopped in the middle of the road and nobody would move. Nobody would go to point B, point A, or anything like that. They were just all static. Now again, maybe at the time when I did have the mod installed, it could have potentially had some issues. I could have potentially somehow installed it incorrectly. Either way, I personally had a bad time with it and it kind of killed the whole idea of me using that mod. Although it would be cool, but again, my personal experience, it just wasn't fun and the constant crashes was a lot to deal with. But another big reason why I don't use mods for Ghost Recon Breakpoint is because I have a lot of console viewers, which means people who play on console are unable to install these cosmetic mods or Spartan mod or whatever mod. And I'm personally simply not a big fan of showcasing mods mods that my console viewers cannot access. The only games that I personally accept mods for is single player games and of course State of Decay 2. For the ones who don't know, I am currently doing a No Man's Land mod playthrough in State of Decay 2 as we speak. If you are unfamiliar with State of Decay 2, feel free to check out my videos and my recent live streams of it, but it's basically an open world zombie survival game and it's amazing. Can't wait for State of Decay 3. But also, if you are unsure what the No Man's Land mod is, basically, in a way, it would be the equivalent to the Ghost Recon Breakpoint Spartan mod. It takes State of Decay 2's most highest difficulty, which is Lethal Zone, and times it by 10. It's little the hardest difficulty you could probably even play in that game unless there's another mod that's even harder but the whole reason why i am explaining this is because when i play state of decay 2 with the no man's land mod and i have an xbox friend join my game although they are on console and unable to install the mod since they are in my game with the mod activated they still experience the no man's land mod now i am unsure if the spartan mod works the same for co-op and ghost recon breakpoint but due to the fact that individual difficulty is already separate when you play with the France and Ghost Recon, I don't think Spartan Mod would actually transfer over to the Xbox friend who joins your game. But yeah, that basically answered the do I use mods question. The answer is no, I do not. The reasons are sometimes it can be complicated or difficult to install. Sometimes they are broken and sometimes they don't work. Sometimes they cause my game to crash. 
And last but not least, and a very important reason to me personally, is I deeply am not a fan of showcasing mods that my console viewers cannot access and replicate in their own game. I hope all that makes sense and people understand. Now moving on to the next question. What is my in-game settings? Let's first start off with the world parameters. Now obviously on the left side you have three different parameters that you can play as. I usually go with classic since I've already beaten the main campaign of the game. Now drone presence I usually have on reduced because again since I've already beat the entire campaign for me personally I feel like it makes a lot of sense lore wise and a little bit more immersive since I've already went through the entire campaign done all these missions took down all these different leaders destroyed all these different drones I feel like sentinel and whatever wolves are left on the island they're not really going to have that many drones left since you blew up majority of them already I don't believe you would have constant drones swarming the island in this the other so i have it set to reduced even on reduced you will still run into drones just not everywhere at all times some missions like elite faction missions will usually have a pretty heavy drone presence i do enjoy drone presence being reduced now if i did start a whole brand new playthrough at the very beginning obviously i would put the drone presence back to classic because of course immersive fleet that would make sense but at the end of the campaign, reduced just feels better and more immersive. Now let's look at Azrael patrol frequency. Currently, I have it set to classic, which basically means if you're out in the free roam area, which obviously the entire map is considered free roam, but technically areas like this can be considered the free roam area because you're not inside a base, you're outside an open area, which means that there is a chance that a helicopter will fly over or the Azrael drone will fly over. But once you get close enough to a base, like the World Seafault here, the game considers the player to be like in a very specific area, like a base, which basically means Azrael drones and helicopters won't randomly fly over your head. I hope that makes sense. I'm not very good at explaining things. But yeah, since I usually spend majority of my time actually inside a location, or a base, I rarely even run into these Azrael patrols unless I'm doing my elite covert operations or covert expeditions where I'm traveling across the map on foot, which then I'm spending a lot of time in the quote unquote free roam area. And as you can see in past videos, I run into these things quite often. Now moving on to the helicopter patrol frequency, it's basically the same thing as I just explained for the Azrael patrols. They will usually spawn and fly over the player when the player is in a open area, but being close or next to a bivouac like I am now, they usually won't spawn. They can spawn, don't get me wrong, they can spawn, but it's actually rare for them to spawn when you're at a bivouac. But if I walked right over here, which is about 195 meters from this bivouac, then there's a high chance that they would start spawning. And of course, just like the Azrael patrols, if the player is in a location or a base, then they won't spawn, period. Now, unlike the Azrael patrols, these helicopter patrols seem to spawn very often. I've actually noticed how often they spawn in some of my recent covert expeditions and elite covert operation videos. They spawn like every two or three minutes, it feels like. I could be wrong about the timing, but that's what it feels like. Now, for the ones who are wondering why I play with Classic instead of Resistance, it's because, as you can see, it says Outcast Rebels Presence in Aurora, Resistance Missions Available, da 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 da. Basically, there's more Resistance roaming around the map, which is cool and all, but there's been so many times in the past where I'm trying to stealth infiltrate a base, and then a random squad of these Resistance Rebel fighters freaking show up and start blasting everybody, and then it just turns into chaos. Now, if you do love more chaos and open combat, then Resistance might actually be a better event parameter for you to play on. But since I obviously prefer stealth and everything, covert, and this and the other i personally prefer classic so it really comes down to personal preference really now operation amber sky is pretty cool don't get me wrong but it's only cool for about an hour or two and then i get bored of it but it is still pretty cool and i might actually make a few videos in this event perimeter coming up soon who knows now there is one world event perimeter that is no longer here now for you new players you probably have never experienced it but there was a terminator event perimeter a long time ago and it is where the game would spawn terminators randomly out of nowhere and they would show up they would start blasting the enemy they would start blasting the wolves they would start blasting you it was crazy and it was pure chaos and part of me loved it and part of me hated it because once again taking a look at the world sea fault i would be trying to stealth infiltrate this that the other planning strategizing target priority this that the other and then all of a sudden out of nowhere a freaking terminator would just 
start walking up at the base and everybody would go crazy start shooting it and the terminator would just fucking wipe everybody again it was a lot of fun it was also very annoying it was pure chaos some of you who never got to experience it would have probably loved it now let's move on to ghost experience parameters now as you can see some of them should be pretty obvious to tell what kind of settings i have gear level is set to off i do not recommend playing with gear level there's so many different reasons why i recommend turning gear level off but i'm just gonna leave it at gear level off is a lot more fun and a lot more immersive to play as compared to gear level on for the ones who don't know when ghost recon breakpoint first released back in 2019 2020 there was only gear level on ubisoft realized the mistake they made they eventually added in the option to turn gear level off or on depending on how the player preferred to play. I prefer gear level off. It's a lot more immersive. It's a lot more quote unquote realistic in a video game. And I definitely recommend people playing gear level off. I'm sure there's a lot of other Ghost Recon players who can say the same. Now taking a look at the enemies difficulty. Obviously you can see I have it set to extreme. I always play extreme. There's no really in depth explanation behind it. I just play extreme and that's that. Now let's take a look at tactical difficulty. Technically, it is set to elite, but if I go down to custom and take a look at what's changed, the only thing that is changed is my main weapon slots. On elite default, it is set to one, but I like to carry a second primary sometimes, so I have it set to two. Obviously, a lot of you who watch my videos know sometimes I do go with one primary, sometimes I go with two, depending on the situation and the video, etc, etc. But that is the only setting that has changed. The only other setting here that I change sometimes, depending, is the Darkest Night. By default, Elite Settings, it is set to on. But sometimes I do turn it off specifically for the quality of the video. Now, for the ones who don't know, let me teach you a thing or two about a thing or two, alright? When you upload a video to YouTube, YouTube loves to heavily compress that video no matter how high the quality is youtube will compress actually the higher the quality the more compression it takes from my understanding i could be wrong about that regardless though youtube does compress video files now i typically record and upload in 4k and YouTube still compresses that and sometimes there can be a little pixelations the darker the screen is. So basically what I'm trying to say is with the YouTube video compression, the darker the video, the higher the chance of pixelation and low quality sh to show up in the video. Now obviously you can still use NVGs but YouTube still sees it as a low light video which can still cause pixelation. Right now I have it set to darkest night off. But let's go ahead and switch it to on and see just how dark it gets. And just like that, it is pretty dark. Obviously, the moon is up, so there's a little bit of light, but it is pretty dark. And YouTube probably doesn't like this. I want the best quality for my viewers' experience. So if I need to have darkest night off, so there's a little bit more light at night, then I'm going to do that. Because as a content creator, you also have to take in the factor that not every single viewer is going to be watching from the comfort of their room, on a computer, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Some people are going to be watching on a phone, a laptop at work with a, a bright lit room, a bright lit lunch room, maybe in the vehicle with the sunlight, et cetera, et cetera. So the darker the screen, the less they're going to be able to see. And of course you can still use NVGs obviously, but it doesn't really light up the game or the video that way. Well. And switching back to Darkest Night Off with the NVG still on, obviously you can see it got a lot brighter, which is probably, again, a lot better for the YouTube video quality. And of course, as a viewer, it makes it a little bit easier for you to see what the hell is going on in the video. Now, with all that being said, let's move on to the rest of the settings. The next one is Interface. Obviously, it is set to custom. I'm not going to go down and explain every single detail. I'm just going to scroll through. You can pause the video if you need to, to just take a look and see what setting I have if you want to match your settings with mine. But for anyone who is wondering or questioning or just simply want to ask me why do I have some of the notifications or some of the loot icons, mission reminders, etc, etc on, it is just simply so I can see where things are and I can easily locate it easily grab it like a weapon cache or a loot container or a mission objective because i do have plenty of videos in the past of me having every single one of these turned off there's simply no hud period and 
and <laughs> let me tell you there was times where it would take me 5 10 an extra 20 minutes just to find a piece of intel or a freaking um loot crate where i or i would have to constantly pause and look at the map and be like oh where is it it's over here where the fuck is it i can't see it i can't find it so in all reality some of the markers like um loot boxes etc etc is turned on just to save um video time uh save myself time and also make it a little bit easier in just gameplay itself. But um, there is one thing I do want to note because I do notice some people ask me about my compass. So if you want the compass in the bottom right, but not the actual minimap, you go to minimap, you go to always, and then you go to minimap visual and you set it to light. That's what you do, and as you can see in the um, screen that it's showing, the bottom right shows the compass. Now, unfortunately, I wish there was a way to have, like, whenever they find a body or the enemies get alerted and it kind of glows around the compass, I wish there was a way to deactivate that, because I do have detection clouds off and all this stuff, so I thought that would do it, but um, that doesn't do the trick, so I, I kind of... I'm I'm Honestly, it's growing on me. I'm kind of okay with it, but that is probably the one thing I wish I could removed from that but yeah input reminders sometimes i do forget my um key uh key binds sometimes i'm uh i don't know if it's e or l or b to freaking grab intel but yeah a lot of the stuff is simply to um cut down video time and quality of the video etc 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 and i hope everyone understands that and honestly if you were really curious about my um settings i hope this helps i'm gonna scroll back up one more time just so in case you guys need to pause, maybe you miss something, take a look. Here it is. Um, yeah, I'm not going to explain every single thing. Also, the notifications is on dynamic, obviously. Um, just, <laughs> just because sometimes I forget what the fuck I'm doing. Like if I'm doing like one of the elite covert operations and I'm doing like a faction missions, sometimes I forget what mission I'm doing. And I hate constantly pausing the, uh, the game just to see what the mission is. So... It's um, it's the quality of life, I suppose. Uh, because at the end of the day, it is a video game. And etc, etc, etc. So I hope that helps everybody. And answers some questions that some people have about my interface settings. Now, I'm not too sure if anyone is curious about the aiming and camera gameplay settings. But I'm going to go ahead and briefly show it. For anyone who is curious, again, you can just simply pause the video if you need to, so you can properly get a good look at the settings. There's actually not many settings here, um, but yeah. Now, some people do question me on my keybinds. I'm not, again, I'm not going to go through and explain every single thing, but I will scroll through slowly and you can pause the video and take a look if you need to. I do play on PC, so obviously I use keyboard and mouse. Almost everything is custom to what I prefer and the way I play, etc., etc. So these keybinds are very, very, um, very custom to my play style and how I feel comfortable with the keyboard, etc., etc. So there is all of this. So I'm just going to scroll through. You can pause it, do whatever. Then I'll go to the combat and squad and then go through. I know some people ask me about my aim mode. I, I have it um, on um, the left alt button. Class technique is um, on my mouse. So um, I guess that's why it shows red. But um, the class technique is um, technically on my mouse. It, I think it's mouse four. It says B2, but it's mouse four. yeah also optical camo as well is um b5 i mean not b5 but it's mouse five um it says b1 but it's um uh, it's mouse five it's the other side button on my on my um mouse but yeah i'm just gonna keep scrolling i'm gonna scroll back up kind of slowly pause if you need to and just uh keep on moving So yeah, B2 is mouse 4 and B1 is mouse 5. 
in the uh, settings. Now moving on to my video settings, one that I've actually surprisingly have been getting questioned a lot recently. So I'm just going to scroll through it really quick just to show it. Obviously, once again, I'm just going to go down. You can pause the video as it needed. Um, I honestly haven't really messed with these settings too much. I don't really... Some of these settings I'm not even too familiar with. The game kind of set these settings automatically. I haven't really messed with any of them. Um, yeah, the only one out of these settings that I would probably wouldn't mind turning off is motion blur. I usually turn motion blur off in video games. I I'll go ahead and actually turn it off right now. I don't mind it, um, depending on the game, but yeah, I'll just turn motion blur off. But everything else is basically the game automatic automatically um, set. The only thing here that I really set was the extended FOV. I, I, I have mine at um, 30. Then everything else, the yeah, like I said, the game set to itself. I think I set the window mode to borderless. I think I did that. But yeah, that's basically that. But to audio, again, not really much, uh, much different. I do have music turned all the way down because Ubisoft in almost every single Ubisoft game, they love copywriting the music in their game. Whether it's background music in the main menu, or combat background music, or cinematic music. Ubisoft loves copywriting their music in their games, so I turn that shit off. <laughs> turn that shit off. Because they, uh... They're gonna try to get... They're gonna, they're gonna try to get you with it. So, any of my videos where you hear background music, I add that to myself when I edit the video. So, if you hear background music in a video, I, I put that there. I edited it there. I, I haven't played with music on since the game, you know, released back in what, 2019, 2020? Now we got that over. Let's move on to my favorite attachments. Now going through this, we will kind of probably combine my favorite attachments with my go-to weapons because they're obviously in the same category in a way. All right, looking at the attachments, I'm going to scroll through here really quick so you can just get a quick look at it. The stock doesn't really matter i kind of just pick whatever stock i think looks good for the weapon i'm using um some stocks do have some kind of benefit like negative seven horizontal recoil negative seven time to aim negative five vertical recoil it, i'm gonna be honest it kind of just comes down to <laughs> whatever you want um there's none of these very specific to me i kind of just pick whatever one i i think looks good for the weapon that i'm currently using uh, I do like the SOCOM one or the TAC light. I, I do kind of go with these. Sometimes the mini suit could be. I do like those stocks depending on the weapon. I usually do auto single. I never really do burst. I'm not a big fan of burst fire. And for the underbarrel, obviously you can see it's the STFG angled grip. And the reason is for the negative 10 timed aim plus 10 speed while aiming. And it does give a plus 10 horizontal recoil. But since I am typically shooting with single fire on, um, I never really notice horizontal recoil. But a lot of people do ask me about my attachments and what um, they can do, what they can use to increase their um, aim speed movement. And um, this underbarrel attachment is my go-to if the weapon I'm using allows me to attach this uh, attachment, this is what I'm going with. 100%, it is my go-to underbarrel. My second go-to underbarrel attachment, again, depending on the weapon and what attachments it allows, would be the lightweight vertical foregrip. Obviously, again, as you can see, it gives a negative vertical recoil and it gives that plus 10 speed while aiming it does give a negative 10 reload speed and a plus 15 horizontal recoil the horizontal recoil again shooting single fire i never really noticed i've honestly never really noticed the reload speed be any slower to be fair but i'm sure maybe someone who times it might notice it might be like 0.3 percent slower i have no idea now there is another underbarrel attachment you could use if you wanted to it is called the vented angled foregrip which gives negative 10 time to aim negative 5 vertical recoil plus 5 speed while aiming and a plus 15 horizontal recoil if you want to try that maybe you would like it um you can definitely use it i've used it a few times i think it's okay um but i definitely prefer the stfg angled grip over this when it comes to magazines, I usually go with the standard mag, mostly due to single fire shot. I can really conserve my rounds compared to full auto or burst. 
and um, the reload speed is pretty average sometimes if you guys ever actually notice and pay attention to the weapon in my video sometimes I actually do switch to the small magazine for that 10 plus reload speed and for the barrels sometimes I go back and forth it kind of depends on the weapon and the mood I'm in and what I'm doing for the video but I usually use standard but sometimes I do switch to the short barrel now taking a look at the laser sight the mall laser sight is the one I usually go for it is probably my go-to laser sight it is the green laser sight that you see the reason why I go for it is obviously I use no crosshair so the green laser sight can typically be pretty easy for me to actually see when I'm aiming third person it also gives a 10 plus range to your weapon and negative percent sway and negative 20% shot spread but realistically speaking I kind of use all three of these laser sights again it depends on the video depends on my mood depends on the weapon etc etc but my go-to would be the mall DA laser sight and then the second one I would probably go with the times three laser sight because for the ones who don't know this laser sight right here actually does not have the NVG flashlight that you see at nighttime when you have your night vision activated this is the only laser sight that does not show that flashlight the mall laser sight and the pec 15 have that flashlight that you see when your nvgs are activated the times three is the only one that does not have it so if you don't want to be seeing the uh flashlight when you're using nvgs then you can use this laser sight but you do have to keep in mind that this laser sight can be inaccurate most of the time it's pretty off now the rangefinder is a pretty good attachment as well. I typically attach this to my DMRs or even sniper rifle if it allows it. Obviously you can see why it gives a 15% plus to range and unfortunately a 15 plus time to aim. But if you're sniping you're probably hard scoping through that freaking telescope anyway so time to aim probably doesn't even matter for you. But if I'm using a DMR and I'm moving in close quarter combat then the mall can be pretty good for that as well since it gives a 10 plus range now the scope once again as i've kind of explained for all the other attachments it really depends on the weapon i'm using and what i'm wanting to do in the video but my go-to is the digital site it's probably my favorite site in the game it is both a one-time and a four-time scope my second favorite scope to use is the exp 3x g33 i love this scope honestly if the digital site did not exist in the game this would probably be my number one go-to scope to use now if i was to look at the shotgun obviously as you can see aptable three because when i use the shotgun i'm not a big fan of the flashlight being there and i typically go for the breacher stock for the negative seven time to aim and of course as you can see using the stfg angled grip for that 10 plus speed while aiming and out of the sights that are usually available for a shotgun, I kind of prefer the I kind of prefer the red dot over the other ones. But honestly, I don't mind the built-in iron sights either. Now I'm going to quickly show what I typically use on my DMRs. I'm going to use the G28s as reference. Get the standard barrel, standard mag, suppressor, the mall, laser sight, digital sight, extended stock, and once again the STFG angled grip. Now for pistols, there's not really that many options to actually add on to the pistol. So obviously I'm using the suppressor and then the usual handgun laser sight. The times three laser sight just kind of looks pretty massive. And uh, I don't know, I just kind of like the way the standard laser sight looks to be, to be fair. Like the normal laser sight, you know, I don't know. It just looks a little bit more uh, confined. I don't know the correct term that I'm trying to say here. Now with the attachments out of the way, let's look at my go-to weapons. Now my typical go-to assault rifles would be the 4AC, the 416, K1A, the M4A1 Tactical, and honestly any 416 or M4 variant for that matter. I love those type of weapons. My go-to DMRs would be the G28, the M110, which basically performs almost exactly the same as the G28, so it really comes down to personal preference. M4A1 Scout. I only have the custom one available for this account. The Scorpio Scout as well. Again, the Quiet variant is the only one I currently have for this account. I have not went out to get the other one just yet. And I've been recently using the MK14. I gotta say, I've actually been enjoying it. Video on that will release soon. Now let's take a look at the SMGs. My go-to SMGs would be the Bullpup PDR which performs exactly the same as the Honey Badger. So all the people out there that says the Honey Badger is the GOAT or the best weapon in the game, etc., etc. For one, 
you're wrong. For two, the bullpup literally is the same weapon, just a different cosmetic. I also enjoy using the Echelon SMG. Honey Badger as well. It's basically the same thing as the bullpup. MP5. I actually haven't used the P90 recently, so I might make a video on that soon. The UMP and my all-time favorite SMG, the MP7. That thing is a beast, and honestly, it's probably my favorite up-close and personal weapon to use in the game. Now let's take a look at sniper rifles. There's only two sniper rifles that I really have any true experience with, and that is going to be the TAC-50 and the Recon A1. I know some people have recommended the Paladin sniper rifle, which I haven't used that weapon in a long time, but maybe I'll have an upcoming video of me actually showcasing that weapon. And for shotguns, my go-to is the M4 Shorty, the M590A1, and the RU-12SG. Those are my typical go-to shotguns. For pistols, I prefer the L40, the P227, which the survival variant is the only one that I have for this account. I still got to go get the uh, original and the 1911. Now, with all that being said, that basically covers my go-to attachments and my preferred weapons. And I already know that I'm probably going to miss some weapons. So I'm going to look back on this video and be like, oh, fuck, I forgot to mention this one weapon. God damn it. But as of right now, these are the weapons that come to my mind. But now let's take a look at preferred classes. Now, obviously, there are seven classes. RIP for the one that didn't make it because Ubisoft abandoned the game. For the ones who don't know, there's supposed to be at least another class release. But, uh, yeah. Now, all these classes are good depending on your playstyle and what you're going for. But my top three would be Pathfinder, Panther, and Echelon. Number four would probably be Sharpshooter. The reason why Pathfinder would technically be my number one go-to is due to the scout vision, as you can see. It is the only class and the only way for you to use the white hot thermal, as you can even see in the description below. No other class, no other cosmetic, no other NVG, etc., etc., gives you the ability to use the white hot thermal. Only Pathfinder allows you to use the white hot thermal. Now, if you are unsure what the white hot thermal is, it's basically this. It's basically where heat signatures show up as white instead of the red. And no, it is not NVGs. I see people call it gray NVGs all the time. That is not what this is. This is white hot thermal. Gray NVGs is this. This is gray NVGs. A lot of people get the stuff confused, but this right here is the gray NVG that you can get by using any kind of third echelon, fourth echelon, quote unquote, splinter cell cosmetic, like the mask that I'm currently wearing. If I go through here and remove this third echelon mask and put on this, I'm wearing nothing. And then I go and put on like a helmet, you know, whatever. Um, I just go with the future soldier helmet and then just put on like normal L3 GP NVGs, bada bing, bada boom. It is now green NVGs. As you can see, this is the green NVG. And then I go back. I'll go back, I go to mask. I put on the third echelon mask here. And it is now gray NVG. This right here is white heart thermal. It is the white hot version of the red infrared. I hope that kind of explains things because I see people in the comment section get confused about it all the time, but hopefully this makes sense. So for example, if I throw my drone over here at the world sea fault and I look at these enemies, I activate the white heart thermals and this is what it looks like. All the heat signatures are white. Everything else is kind of like a gray, black, you know, a dark color, heat signatures, vehicles, uh, enemies, civilians, they're all white. And then you can activate these gray NVGs. And as you can see, everything is basically a NVG, but gray colored. And then again, you have the infrared. This is the standard thermal vision in the game. I go back and I remove this mask. I remove this mask and I don't wear it. And then, you know, my guy's wearing normal NVGs. It's green. So my drone white hot thermal this is white hot thermal see the white heat signatures activate NVGs and it is green and then again you got the um, infrared so yeah again I hope all that is making sense and people was I'm gonna understand what I'm talking about 
Again, the only way to use the White Heart Thermal is by playing as the Pathfinder class. Now looking at the perks, the top 5 perks that I would typically go for is Slim Shadow for the 80 plus Stealth and the 10 plus Agility, Ballistic Advantage for that 60 plus Range and 30 plus Handling. Also for those who don't know that 60 plus Range is active for any weapon you use, whether it's a DMR, Sniper, ASR, Pistol, SMG, etc, etc. It is active for any weapon you use. The third perk would be the Explosives Expert. Now the main reason why I use this, it does have a nice 20% explosive damage bonus and a 20% item area of effect, which makes the blast radius even bigger. But the main reason why I use it is that 60 plus throw range. You can throw a bullet lure or a di diversion lure or a grenade or whatever, so much further um, with this um, perk. So I typically run these three in almost every class that, uh, that I use. But the fourth perk that I sometimes switch in and out is called Pistola, which gives you a 20% damage with your handgun, negative 20% technique cooldown. So if you use your technique pretty often, you actually get it back pretty quick using pistols and using this perk and also you get 50 percent xp bonus which i don't think that truly matters but it is there and then the fifth perk is kind of tied between two different perks so i guess you can say fifth and sixth but it would be sensor hack which gives you 30 percent drone evasion and 10 percent damage to drones so if i'm infiltrating an area that has a heavy drone presence i do like to throw this perk on and then the next perk would be feel no pain so if I know for a fact I'm about to get myself in an open combat scenario and I'm playing on extreme difficulty where two, three bullets can have me injured or even dead, this perk is very nice to have active so it kind of reduces the chances of becoming injured considering it takes probably one bullet and then you're injured. So having that 50% injury resistance is very nice. And that is and that is going to be it for the perks, but I do have something special I would like to show you guys for the ones who are unaware. If you go to a bivouac and you deploy it, and you watch your character do this pretty cool animation to set up his camp. If you look at the bottom left here and see preparations, as you can see, you have six different preparations that you can do that give you some kind of bonus. You have 40% injury resistance, which is very nice to have if you do not feel like running the no pain perk. You also have hydrate, which increases your endurance by 80%. If I'm not mistaken, I think this basically allows you to sprint longer which is pretty cool. And then again, you have tech review, which increases your drone speed. This is the one that I recommend for the people who like to use their recon drone pretty often. It really makes a difference on how fast you can have your drone move around. And then you have stretching, which increases your stamina by 20%. So, so with that being said, increases your stamina. This one actually might allow you to sprint longer. While I think the hydrate just allows you to not become so fatigued. And then you have weapon review, which increases your weapon's accuracy by 20%. That is crazy. And then, of course, you have resources, which increase your XP gain by 10%. So if you're getting yourself an open combat scenario, if there's a mission that is throwing you against all these open combat situations and you're struggling playing on a higher difficulty, I definitely recommend doing the eating preparation to increase your injury resistance. Or if you like to, or if you like to throw up your drone every five fucking seconds, then tech review for that drone speed increase is also really good too. And then of course, if you simply want to just increase your weapon's accuracy, then you have the weapon review preparation you can do as well for that nice 20% bonus. So out of all of these, I think the eating, the tech review, and the weapon review are probably the top three best preparations you can do. I suppose they're all kind of good because doing the stretching to increase your stamina is pretty nice as well if you do a lot of sprinting. And speaking on all of that, let's go ahead and look at the rations that you can craft. If you want to know how to craft something, if you are setting out a bivouac, it would be setting right here between shop and tactics. But all you do is simply hit craft. This is where you can craft gadgets like grenades, mines, etc, etc. But if you go over to rations, then you have all of these to choose from. Now, if you combine some of these rations, with the preparations that you did and with the perks that you have selected, you can get a crazy lowdown going. Look at this one right here. This one gives you a 20% injury resistance. So imagine you do the 40% injury resistance preparation. You use the feel no pain perk, which gives a 50%. So that's already 90. And then you use this. This is 110% injury resistant bonus. Now, I don't know if it would cap at 100%. But that is still crazy. Another crazy one is this one right here that gives a 25% throw range. 
All you have to do is select whatever ingredients you need to actually craft the item, which is usually plants and whatever you find out in the world of the game. And then once you have whatever ingredients you need, you just start crafting away. And boom, there you go. You can even craft a ration that gives you a 10% agility bonus. Now, once you have some of these rations selected, the way for you to find them is the same way you find your normal gadgets like a grenade or C4. You can go either to your inventory, and once you do, you'll see everything listed here. Or you can even put it on your gadget wheel. All you do is select a slot, find which one you want to place, and then boom, now you have it on your gadget wheel. And you do the exact same thing as if you're going to throw a freaking flashbang. You select it, and then you press whatever your button is, your person does whatever they do. There you go. Now I have the 50% throw range. That is insane. How far can I throw this thing? Look at how far I can throw this. It's all the way over there. You can barely see it. Let me see if I can, um, if it would have like a different thing with a. Uh... Look at that. That is, that is so far away. That is a far freaking throw, dude. So that is 50% bonus from the ration, plus another 60% from the perk. Let's see what happens if I remove this perk. Let's put on Pistola instead. So that is how far you can throw without the combination of the perk and the ration. That is still pretty insanely far. I'm going to put the perk back on. Look at these guys down here. That's a pretty far throw. Let me see with my drone. It's about a 245 meter throw. I do have the high ground, but still, let's see exactly how far I can throw this. Hang on, I'm gonna throw this instead. I think it just disappears if I go too far. That is a far throw. I'm gonna throw it. Damn. I don't even know where it went. Oh, I think it blew up in the air. All right, I'm gonna throw a bullet. Cause I think the diversion lord blew up in the air. It wasn't even able to make it. It landed right here. Now, for the ones who don't know, if you're aiming through your weapon and you use this to try to determine a distance, it's maxed at like 150. So obviously, way over there is not 150 meters. So when you're aiming through your scope, it maxes out at like 150. So if you see it hit 149, it doesn't seem right. Then you can either use your drone to quickly get it, or you can use your um, binoculars. Let's see if I can fuck with these guys a little bit more. I'm gonna just do this. I have no idea where it's gonna go. It landed right here. It landed right there. That is... Right there. It's 227 meters from where I'm at. <laughs> Again, I don't know if it caps at 100%, but if it doesn't, if it's like 110%, that is a massive throw range. But yeah, guys, as you can see, if you combine your preparations, your perks, and your rations, you can get some crazy loadouts going. Now, obviously for me, before you ask, do I use any of these rations? Actually, no. That was my first time ever even using that ration. I had no idea that it would give me such a massive throw range bonus. That was pretty insane. I'm walking through bushes. But now of my new discovery of how crazy some of these combinations could be, you might actually see me using some of these rations in future videos. But I think that's about covered everything that I wanted to talk about and showcase in this video. I hope everyone enjoyed. I probably did miss something or a couple of things. And I'm of course going to look back at the video and be like, ah, oh, fuck. If there is anything else you want to know, let me know in the comment section down below. I hope you enjoyed this video. I hope you learned a thing or two about a thing or two. And you guys will see me in the next one.